You can't go anywhere without somebody having an opinion or a piece of advice about how to handle your finances. Today, we have nine pieces of advice you should just straight up ignore. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. There really are things I can't help but read articles, see blog posts, and there is all these things that you're like, that sounds okay. But then you like dig into the actual, the details, the meat of the situation. Yeah. Like, no, that's horrible advice. Absolutely. Why would you do that? So in some of these, and look, there's probably varying degrees of how bad the advice is. Yep. So I'll make sure that I kind of color it a little bit with what, you know, if, if this is, has some semblance of, of truth to it, oh. but overall you might want to think about it as bad advice. I think that's the big thing that I took away, Brian, as we were doing some show, pre-show prep. Remember that game when you played as a kid, uh, telephone, where like one person says something and then they whisper to the one next person, the next right. person. And by the time it gets to the end of the line, it, it's a completely different sentence, completely different idea than what the original person started with. I feel like a lot of financial advice that circulates out there is sort of that same thing. It starts off as one thing, sort of well-intended, and then as it sort of morphs through time, it degrades into something that is not ab that. absolutely the best advice, not something you should follow. So you're saying there's components that might be like the initial advice, but over time, it's definitely that's exactly all right. skewed. Yep, that's exactly right. So you you want to just jump into these things? By yep. the way, moneyguy.com. Go out there, give us your email address as well as your zip code. So in case we drop into your neighborhood, we know where it, ever, all of our mm -hmm. audience is. And by the way, the, the that that has been growing. As you can see, our subscribers, as I told you at the end of last show, we've added over 5,000 new subscribers on YouTube just in the last two to three weeks. So please keep that up. And But here's the thing. I tell you that we've added 5,000 people. You know what the percentage of you that are just kind of voyeurs that come and just watch our content and then disappear, it's 80% of you. Yeah. Only 20% of our audience is actual subscribers. The other 80% are those that you love our content, but you just drop them by. So go ahead, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and let us know you're happy. Yeah, and I think another, we keep getting this question. I feel like we answer every show. There's a counter behind us, and it ticks as we're going through the show. That's our live subscriber counter. So if you're watching the show and you subscribe, you'll see it tick. Uh, we keep getting asked that question. I feel like people people would know that by now. But uh, And if you're out there uh, listening in iTunes world, iHeartRadio world, Stitcher world, any of the audio worlds, and you haven't had a chance to go out to YouTube and check out the video format, go check it out because it's a different way to experience it and you get to kind of see how, uh, how goofy we are sometimes. So here's the first one. This one's a big one. Pay off your mortgage as quickly as possible. Now that, now that one, uh, I'm sitting here thinking, how can that be bad? That's a good thing, right? We, we, we harp all the time on debt is bad. You shouldn't have debt. You don't want to owe more than you own. Uh, and we're sitting here saying that when someone tells you pay off your mortgage as quickly as possible, that's a piece of advice that you ought to ignore. Well, here's the thing. And you guys should know, you're probably wondering, is that Brian that's out there perusing his way through the YouTube comments it is indeed. <laughs> I am one of the people that's out there poking around. And this is one that I've been getting a lot of flack about. I'll tell you the ones where when I'm, I see who's writing comments and we appreciate all comments. I want as much dialogue as possible, but you guys have been listening and look, I love getting out of debt early, mm -hmm. but here's the thing. And I'm going to make this as concise as possible for all you straight to the point crowd. Your money when you're in your twenties and when you're in your thirties is worth way too much. The potential it has to be paying down low interest debt. Now I want you paying off your credit cards. I want you paying off, you know, I had a couple in here yesterday that had um, student loan interest that was getting close to 7%. Sure. I'm okay with prepaying that stuff early. But if you tell me you have a mortgage, it's in the threes, maybe even a 4% mortgage, what are you doing if you're in your 20s and 30s? So you're not talking necessarily about someone who's in their 50s or 60s thinking about finally retiring the mortgage or getting out of debt. It's a different conversation for those folks and the folks who still have decades upon decades of compounding that could take place. A lot of opportunity for that compounding interest. Time is on their side, so they need to take advantage of it. Remember, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but a dollar for a 20-year-old has the potential to turn into $88 by the time they're 65. Mm -hmm. A dollar for a 30-year-old can turn into $23 at retirement. Mm -hmm. 40 year old, a dollar turns into seven. Do you see that big drop off we sure. have? The 20 year old, it's 88. 40 year old, it's seven. And you know, that's, a, that's a huge yeah. difference. And then uh, the one dollar for a 50 year old is three dollars. So if, if you were getting close to 50, if you're in your late 40s, early 50s, I'm perfectly fine if you want to be sure. debt free. But it's the younger people that I'm worried about. And let me close, do this one thing too. 
the better way. Bo and I are nerdy enough that, I, I kid you not, because here's the, the better way if you think about this. I love that Chris Hogan and his everyday millionaire, mm -hmm. um, and then Dave Ramsey, because he's part of the Ramsey Solutions, they had this great research piece on millionaires. And what they found was is that millionaires pay off their mortgage typically right around 10 years. I think it's like 10.2, okay. 10 10.3 years. That is good advice. But the thing I think is bad is if you're a 20-year, that's I don't think that, that data is a little misleading in one case. I resemble who he's talking about. Okay. And I will have this house I currently live in paid off in 10 years. Okay. But this is my third house. So this isn't a goal that you had 20 year old Brian. This when is I now. bought my first house in my twenties, if I would have paid off shot to pay that thing off within 10 years, mm -hmm. there's a lot of money in my army of dollar bills that would have been left on the table. My second house that I bought in my thirties, if I would have focused on paying that off in 10 years, I'd have left a lot of money on the table. Let me give you the example. Here's what I actually had Bo run for me. You guys are gonna be like, wow, they really are nerdy. And we're gonna do something with this too. We will turn it into a graph or do something. Love I said, give me this. I said, take a 30 year old. Let's assume that he has a three and a half percent mortgage rate. Okay. Before you say those don't exist, that's what I have. I have a three and a half percent mortgage rate. 30 year old, but he's gonna take Dave and Chris's advice. He's gonna pay it off within 10 years. So yep. by the time he's 40 years of age, the house will be completely paid off. Well, so what's great about that is when he gets to 40, he'll have all that extra money that he can just start investing. And really so start from throwing 40 it. to 65, we're gonna let him take every bit of that money that he was paying down, the, the, the amount of money required to pay it down. He's gonna keep investing that. Cause that's kind of what the, the advice is, is that after you pay off your debt, go invest right. and you, you'll have lots of money. So we did that illustration and then he's got, we got a counterpart who's the same guy who's 30 years old, bought the house, He's paying his house off over the 30-year normal cycle. Okay. Now that's a little different than the advice I gave, but I want to have an sure. illustration here. But then he's but we said we said, what's the difference between what the guy who's paying it off in 10 years and the guy who's paying it off 30 years? We're gonna let that difference in amount be what he just invests. Yep. Let that money go work. That's his army of dollar bills. He's gonna do that all the way from But he's not paying off until he's 60 years of age. Mm -hmm. But he is still investing sure. that difference between paying it off. But then by the time he reaches 60, he's got five years to invest the rest, just like his buddy who paid it off sure. in 10 years. We did it. Here's the assumptions we used. We did a $300,000 mortgage. I mean, a $300,000 house, so a $240,000 mortgage. Yep. We use a 3.5% mortgage rate. And then we said, because you guys are blowing up my comment section with the 10%, I said, let's just assume a 7% rate of return. So it's really only a 3.5% spread right. between what you pay in mortgage interest and what your performance is on your investments. The difference at age 65 was the guy who was just paying off the normal mortgage over a 30 year cycle, investing the difference was $500,000. So I'm, I'm gonna say that differently. If I was a young person and I have a three and a half percent spread from my mortgage rate to the rate of return I can earn in my portfolio, by prepaying my mortgage over 10 years instead of investing in that first 10 years. In your 30s. Realize your 30s. If, if I would have done this for a 25 year old, it would have blown this up even bigger that, because you'd have had five more years of compounding interest. So paying off my mortgage early would have cost me half a million dollars. And that's at a 7% or as you said, three and a half percent spread. If you made 8% on your money okay. or a four and a half percent spread, it'd have been an $800,000 loss opportunity. And then if you would have made 10%, for those people who are out there buying the S&P 500 and things like that, that 6.5% spread would have resulted in a $1.8 million difference. That's huge. So That's huge. I think that shows problem solved. So if you're someone out there who's uh, hear, hearing advice or you have older folks or you have just colleagues or friends and hey, you know, you got to get out of debt. You got to pay off that mortgage. Don't worry about the 401k. Don't worry about the Roth IRAs pay off the mortgage, you may just want to think about the numbers because that may be a very seemingly good decision This can have some drastic long-term possible and negative consequences. And look, and I think the data is right. I think I love the data that, that Dave and Chris put together because I resemble exactly what they're talking about. I am in my late 40s. My goal is about around 50. I want to be completely debt-free. Sure. So I, I get it and I know I'm leaving. Look, I recognize going against the advice I just gave, I'm leaving some money on the table of opportunity costs because sure. I could probably invest, make more money. But at 50, 
I kind of just want to be debt free and I don't yep. feel like I'm leaving a lot on the table. Love it. All right. So let's stay in that same vein. So the first piece of bad advice was pay off your mortgage as quickly as possible. It seems like a lot of the information that is, is misleading out there uh, is tied to housing and mortgages and that sort of thing. Am I right on that? That, that is. So let's, let's run into number two. Why waste money on rent when that could be a mortgage payment? Uh, so we hear that all the time because pe people say, and we hear this especially from uh, recent college grads that just got out of school that say, you know what, I'm just going to go buy my first house because I don't want to throw away money on rent. At least if I go buy a house, I'm building equity, I'm starting to save up, I'm starting to create something. If I rent, I'm just throwing my money away. And I think there's a lot of people, and look, there is part of the American dream that is built on owning a house. Right. Right? So yep. I get that. But I will tell you, we did an Ask the Money Guy series recently, and I pointed to a CNBC article that showed that as of, we haven't seen this happen since 2010, but recently there has not been, because of how much houses have appreciated right. and how much, you know, this has all made the cost of renting more affordable than actually buying in the average, if you look at the entire United States. Now, every little area is different. Sure. So we did cross a line, though, that renting might be better. Okay. But I will tell you, I think you got to go more. Here's the better way I would look at this, is that you need to have a plan. If you are planning roots, meaning mm -hmm. that you're going to live in this community, you're probably going to raise children in this community, the children will be going to the local school system, I think it's better to own. Okay. I mean, just because it's your house, I get it. It is part of that American dream. Um, but you have to, it's because you have to look at it from a healthy standpoint and know that this is a use asset. So, I mean, it's not all the analytics or the financial decision making that goes into right. it. But if you are one of these people that you know you're moving in three years or you just don't know the area, what in the world are you doing buying a house? right out of the gates. Well, and the other thing is that you don't really know how your life is going to change. Are you certain that the house you want to buy at 21 years old is going to be the house that's going to make sense for family and other things at 30 years old or even at 25 years old? And, and I also think a lot of us, like I moved to a different state. We know that, you know, you move to a different state. Yep. When you move to a different state, it's a little scary in the fact that you don't know where the good neighborhoods are, what the great schools are. You don't know where traffic patterns are yep. and the conveniences. So I will tell you, and even for the business, Abound mm -hmm. Wealth, when we moved our company from Georgia up to Tennessee, we were in a temporary office space for a year, year and a half. We actually had a conversation about that today because the guys, I think, in the next room over talking about how like, like four of us used to crowd into one and we it was not ideal. fond memories of it now, but I look back and I go, what was an established company that's been around for a long time? Being in a temporary yeah. space was humbling. Yep. But I will tell you, I think it led to a great decision in the fact that it was a great decision in the fact that we got to figure out where the community was, how things worked. And then look, you guys know, anybody who's come and visit us, we're in downtown Franklin, right, right over one of the landmark restaurants uh -huh. slash bakeries. You don't get this unless you've been here and you actually meet some yep. people. So it worked out by doing a rent before we bought. I think it all plays out. So just pay attention to what your dreams, visions, and how long you're going to be in the community are so you can make a good decision on the rent versus buy. You know, and I think before we move to the next point, you know, we, ha we haven't, uh, this isn't just for young folks. This isn't just for folks who are buying their first house. We see this all the time with retirees who are thinking about they want to move to a different part of the country. They want to move somewhere else. We always encourage them. One of the beautiful things that renting does is it keeps the maximum amount of flexibility in your pocket to figure out exactly what you said, all the community factors that are gonna make a difference. I got one more real estate one. Okay. Now this one is partially true. It actually could turn out to be a good financial decision, but I think I worry it's going to kill your well-being, your, your happiness factor. It, it's gonna create a lot of insecurity. So here it is. Buy the cheapest house on the street. Okay, so yeah, so you're surrounded by a bunch of wealthy neighbors. I mean, we've even done a show on this before, Brian, about uh, financial decisions you hope that all your friends make. Yeah. So if you move into a neighborhood where all of your friends have the recreational vehicles and the swimming pools and all the nice things, wouldn't that be subscribing to that idea of letting your friends do those things? Your neighbors? I guess, I guess so. But what I'm, what I'm thinking is actually going on here, Bo, is that people, when they buy real estate, I think it's that whole adage of stretch. Okay. You know, buy as much house as you possibly can afford. Right. So if you were taking that to the next step and saying, 
well, I'm going to buy the nicest house I can afford, but it's going to be the cheapest house on this street. Mm -hmm. So I have lots of uh, appreciation, appreciation potential, yeah. potential, right? That's what, that's where, that's where the main, you're like, I'm going to make a fortune when I go to sell yeah. this house. Cause I'm getting in on the ground floor in a really expensive neighborhood. The problem is you're probably the poorest person on the street. Okay. And why is that a problem? If you're the poor, there is so much, we got a show coming up on how much money creates happiness okay. or how much money you need to have to have the, to create happiness. You're going to find that there's a direct correlation to who you're hanging out with, with how happy and fulfilled you are with your money and happiness in life. So what you're saying is if you end up buying the cheapest house in the street with the idea that there's going to be a lot of appreciation potential, you might be setting yourself up for failure because all of the wealthier neighbors around you can do the things that you might not be able to do. If can... you stretch to buy your house, the cheapest house on the street, and all your neighbors are talking about their great European vacations, they're all whipping by you with their fancy cars. All of a sudden, I think after a while, especially if you're starting to socialize with these people, sure. you're going to feel bad about yourself, but then you're going to start having this temptation. Where do you think the Joneses came oh, from? Yeah. The Joneses came from trying to keep up with your peers. You'd be like, oh, I need that a fancy European car. I need to go take my family on vacations. You know, these big, it's not just vacations, it's big vacations. I think all that stuff starts seeping into um, your mind on, yep. on how things are. It's that whole Diderot effect that we've talked about a gazillion times. I was just about to say times. the exact same thing. Because yeah. well, to explain what the Diderot effect yeah, is. Yeah, the Diderot effect is, uh, you know, you buy the nice house, well, then you got to buy the nice furnishings, and then you have to buy the nicer car, and then you have this thing where toys begot toys. So you have, it's kind of this treadmill you get on, well, if you're there in an expensive neighborhood and you don't really, you might not necessarily need to be in that expensive neighborhood, it's going to be a suffocating thing. You're going to have a real hard time getting out from under. So here's the better way. You soberize when you're considering moving. I'm, I want you to think realistically about how you're going to fit in and maybe you just don't need to swim upstream. Yep. I mean, that's the thing that I tell people. I have on paper, because here's the next guideline. I don't want you spending more than 25% of your gross income on housing. That, that's a point worth repeating. So take your monthly income, multiply gross income, multiply it by 25%, your total housing costs should not exceed that number. And there's a portion of you that get to this, maybe like, this is my third house. Okay. On paper now, I could afford even a bigger house. Sure. I'm not doing it. Nope. I'm not swimming upstream anymore because I don't want to be the poorest guy on, on the street. Yep. I just, it's not going to create happiness and it's not going to put me where I want to be financially. Right. And then here's the last thing on doing it a better way. Why are you moving? Why are you moving to this place? Is it deliberately because you, you want to swim upstream and impress people when they ride up to your house? They go, man, this guy must be successful because look at this big old honking house. Because there's a chance if you do it wrong, you're going to price yourself outside of happiness. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Hold on. If the, there's a chance you're going to price yourself out of happiness. There's a lot of things. I mean, I, if you talk to anybody who's out there who's a private pilot or other things, that's what people say. They People will price themselves out of this hobby of piloting yeah. because they keep buying nicer airplanes. Well, nicer airplanes have more costs than other things. It's the same thing with your house. Because I can tell you, when you buy the nicer house, it's going to cost more to landscape it. It's going to cost you more to do repairs. It's going to cost because bigger the houses you, need more the, furniture. Well, they require there's rooms to do. So yep. just think about those things, and you're going to be in a better place. Okay, right. so we, we talked about the biggest piece of debt that most people have. You know, the housing. Uh, but I, and what's funny is I think I'm I think I'm picking up a trend on how you've ordered these because the next one is also a debt thing that you hear, right? Here's a debt one. So first we kind of did debt and real estate. Now let's just talk about debt, everyday debt, like okay. credit cards. So look, we have a guy that we think a lot of, but here's, this, here's, here's the thing you hear. Credit cards should never be used. Yeah, and, and uh, just like I said, that whole telephone thing, that's true for some people. For some people, that's true. If you can't use it responsibly, I hear you say this all the time, Brian, a credit card is like a knife. Yeah. It's a tool. If it's used incorrectly, it can hurt you, but very correctly, it's very useful. I've updated that Oh, based upon one of the emails we recently received. Uh, did, I, did I not see that email? Well, you'll understand it when I tell you this statement. I look at credit cards like a chainsaw. Okay, just like a really f fancy knife. Did you not see that email we got from a listener? Oh, that email. Yeah, no, I mean, no. we had a Do not send any more gross emails, by the way. But we had an e a listener. I have a hair that has decided he's going to go for a ride and hang out right by, right near my eye. So if you see me, 
It's not that I'm trying to throw this mane of hair around. It's that I really am I trying to get a hair out of my I just thought you were doing your McConaughey. I was like, hey. no, this thing is driving me crazy. Turn into McConaughey. But I do look at credit card debt as a useful tool, but an extremely dangerous tool. And I've always used the analogy of a knife. Yep. But I do think there is something about saying that it's more like probably a chainsaw because a knife, I mean, look, a knife, you slip, you get a scar like I've got. Okay. You slip with a chainsaw, you get a, you get a nub. That email that so, we <laughs> so, so this is the thing. That's why I think debt is dangerous enough that you have to look at it. If you are using it and you're not scared of it, you're doing it completely wrong. Yep. And that's something I always tell people because I do think, so let's talk about what's the better way to think about credit card sure. use. Credit card use is the opposite of compounding interest. If you think about it in terms of that the average interest rate on your credit card is 17% right now. The average, national average is 17.3%. So because of that, you guys have blown up my inboxes and comments on YouTube saying, guys, where do you get 10% rates of returns? Well, if you think that's crazy, 17.3% with credit card companies, because it's so punitive, never, ever, ever should you have credit card debt. Debt. You should not carry a balance. If you're carrying a balance, I think you have to go the teetotal route and not have any credit card debt whatsoever. Okay. I do think if you're a person that pays it off every month and you understand how valuable just the convenience of sure. not having to go to the bank and use an ATM a bunch. If you also, I'm one of these people, I actually think that when I have cash in my pocket, I spend more. I know the argument is, is that when you use credit cards, you actually spend more than if because you have cash. Because you don't feel like it. I'm actually, I, will, I usually don't have cash in my pocket. Now, if we have end of times, I'm not the guy you're going to come <laughs> borrow 10 bucks off of because I don't have it. But it's, it's one of those things that I just don't, I think I'm already disciplined enough. I don't know that I buy into that I spend more with a credit card than sure. cash, but I sure get, I get thousands back every year from my cash rewards. Mm -hmm. I also like the purchase protection, the extended warranties, when I travel insurance and other things that come from, there are benefits. So make sure if you're at least going to use credit cards and use them responsibly, maximize those benefits sure. without spending more. That's the key thing. I want you to be disciplined and know what you're dealing with. Uh, you said, I think you said, um, be purposeful, right? Exactly. Because one of the things that I hear all the time, and I think this is just worth mentioning, is someone says, okay, well, if you like the convenience factor and you like that, don't use a credit card, just use a debit card. That way you're never spending money that you don't have. Well, even that inherently has its problems because now, you know, and we've, talked, we've done shows on this before. If you have an issue with your credit card where somebody gets a hold of that and has a fraudulent charge, I think that you're exposed to maybe like $50. They never make you pay that. They never make you pay that. If someone actually gets your debit card and gets access to your bank account, is able to swipe, it, it might be a lot harder to get that We money actually back. had a case study here, somebody here in the office that the bank was going to make them whole, but they told them it was going to have some turnaround time. That okay. is the big difference between debit cards and credit cards. Credit cards, it's somebody, it's OPM, other people's money. Yep. With your debit card, they're using your money. So sure. if there is fraud or hacking or anything like that, they'll, you probably have a chance of getting made whole. It's just going to take a little bit of time to do it. So, okay, so we talked about mortgage debt, which is kind of okay debt. We talked about credit card debt, which is a four-letter word. Yep. Let's talk about some good debt, Brian, because there's good debt out there, right? I love the term good debt because good debt is always your mortgage debt, and your student loans. Yep. But is anybody, if you ever look at how much interest you pay, is any debt really good? I mean, not the interest. I mean, that's the thing. I know we all want to get it paid off. So here's the one the common advice you hear that you need to be careful of is go to college because student loan debt is good debt. You should always invest in yourself. I love that's the way people turn out. You should always invest in yourself. I mean, and that's, look, we now have, because we're getting close to election years, mm -hmm. Student loan debt is getting a lot of play because there's candidates out there talking about they just go, poof, it's all going to disappear one day. You know, yep. you just go forgive all this debt. So it's definitely something to think about. But here's what I think is interesting. Is college always the right decision? And look, I love, I have a hunger for, for education, wisdom. So I, this is not me saying college is for suckers. I don't think that. But I do think you have to measure twice, cut once. Absolutely. I'm making sure it fits because... There was a study in 2015 that 44.6% of, 46, 44 of college grads under 27 are working in careers that don't require college degrees. That's almost half. So ha half of the folks out there are in a job that did not require them to pay the cost that they paid for a college education. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of throw out there is 
what does it cost to go to school and what is this inflation? I mean, we hear about inflation, sure. but why is inflation on college so much more than it is for every other part mm-hmm. of the, it seems like the economy? I have an illustration to pull up. I went to the University of Georgia. I know another guy sitting to my left here that went to the University of Georgia. Go we dogs. have an intern that is also from the University of Georgia. So we thought it'd be interesting if we went and pulled what each of us paid to go to the same college. Yep. Now look, I got an accounting degree, so it probably nudges that value over oh, a little more on the value there proposition, but it's still- Give those things but, away. <laughs> but, but look at this. Now look, I am so old. I graduated in 1996. How old are you? <laughs> I graduated in 1996. The chart didn't go back to that, but it did go to 1998. So Can I just talk enough. about how exciting it is that you graduated so long ago, we couldn't even pull the data I'm on sure the chart for I'm sure if we dug a little harder, we could have found the data. But 1998 is close enough, because I tell everybody when they say, how much did it cost to go to college when you went? I was like, three grand, <laughs> you know, because it was. I went to a state school, UGA. I think that's, like, that's like the f- the cost of like the meal plan these well, days. Well, now you look at it. Well, it's the same thing. My parents bought a house, and I remember when I first moved to Atlanta right out of college, I was paying more in rent a month than my parents were for, for their the full mortgage. house. And by the way, I was the third of the rent. because so we one took third the rent, of it. split it in the third. <laughs> you know, it's the same way with education. If you look at my cost of education, what's on the screen right now, that's a little under $3,000 a year. Yep. Look at Bo. Bo graduated in 2008. It was 6000 6, bucks, almost yep. double so the amount. And then look at Daniel, one of our interns. He's at 12000 Man, my two, my 3000 looks like looks a like steal. Looks like a steal. So if you actually calculated what's the annualized inflation on this, it's 7%. Yep. That's it's a lot. unbelievable if you think about it. I mean, that is a lot. What would it be like if the other items in our lives, you know, the things that we buy on a daily basis, uh, toilet paper, uh, Oreo. I don't know why toilet paper and Oreo is the first two consumer products that come to my mind. That's not, <laughs> most people usually say like coffee, Coca-Cola, bread. Toilet paper, all right, and Oreos. And Oreos, I get this. All right, so we buy we'll go ours. with it. But imagine if those sort of things inflated at 7% the same way that tuition is. There'd be an outrage and an outcry. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, I think the point that we're making is you need to measure twice and cut once because some of those basic necessities you can't live without, like uh, toilet paper and Oreos, there may be certain scenarios where you might not need to go rack up student loan debt only because it's what someone told you you should do or you think it's the natural next evolution of your process. So let's talk about the better way. Here's the, here's the steps and things to think about. I think we, we say this saying all the time because it's this important, is begin with the end in mind. Yep. So when you are in college and you know you're choosing your major, figure out what the anticipated rate of return, I mean, the anticipated first year salary will be for that position and make sure your student loan debt doesn't exceed that amount. That is, yep. that's a it. great thing if you're in that situation. Now, if you're a person that's already come out of school and you've got this student loan debt, you're like, well, thanks. I wish I'd have heard that four years ago. Sure. But now we got you to get you in a situation where you have to just kind of, I did this yesterday for a client that was a prospect that was in the office and they had student loan debt, and I was walking them through. They had five different student loans. Okay. We put them in order and looked at the interest rates, and the ones that were going to be um, you know, long-term hurtful to their, their future, we pay, I told them, let's pay it pay off. It off let's come up yep. with a plan to pay it off. You know, but then they had a few student loans that were in the three range. I was like, well, that's not, that's okay. that's not predatory or, or, or really going to be you know, punitive type of interest rates. So yep. we'll, we'll work that into the debt repayment plan, but it's not going to be something that we're going to forego all savings to pay off that student right. loan. So you have to pay attention to the jobs, pay attention to the market. What I would say also is pay attention to whether, what type of school you're going to. If you know that what you're going to be doing for a living is not going to generate a ton of money, mm-hmm please don't go run up a ton of student loan debt. It just does not make sense sense, um, to do that. Be very realistic about what your income proposition. My daughter is going to a camp right now, and it's something I think she wants to do for a living. I will tell you it's more on the artistic side, which is great. I'm very excited because she's talented, but she's also super analytical. My daughter is wicked smart in math. So I had the conversation where I said, look, I said, I love that you're taking this camp. I said, and you think you want to do this for a living? She goes, yeah. I said, have you thought about the fact that it doesn't, it's probably not ever going to pay a ton of money? And she goes, I, I have actually, Dad. And I said, well, does that, that stop you? And she goes, no, I think I think I like it enough. That'd be okay, it, you know, not making a ton of money with it. And I was like, That's okay, noble. I get yeah. it. So as, as long as we check the boxes 
and knew that, I think that's the decision. And then you can apply that same logic and that same check the box mentality to how much debt do you are you willing to incur and which schools do you go to? So as a parent, given that conversation, given what you, you're you're probably not gonna send her to a really expensive, super prestigious private school. Even, even right. if she could get in, I mean, we had someone in here said, yeah, what if my kid gets into Stanford or Princeton? That's awesome if they get in, that's wonderful, but if the degree that they're gonna get from that school is not gonna be the vocation yeah. they move and into. And I'm not gonna tell you what those degree, you, you know, I don't want anybody writing us hate mail yeah, because right. we, we name some degree that's probably not gonna pay well. But also, I wanna tell you, every time my air conditioner has gone out twice, you know, because I had, it was a gizmo that I had on my system, it's not because, <laughs> I have a women system. Um, I, every time I have a technician come out to my house and I have to write that minimum check, uh -huh. a tradesman is not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I can tell you back in Georgia when I worked in public accounting, one of the biggest clients that I worked on was the owner of an air conditioning company. Okay. And so I'm, there are jo jobs out there as careers and other things. Guys, if you can, because the research out there shows it, that you can get a four year, a four years bachelor degree does make more money, but a two year program as a percent, if you compare the cost of education to earning potential sure. a few years out, it's not as big as you think. Yep. So just be careful, think about that. If you're good with your hands and you don't love sitting in a classroom, it's not the, it, there it's is a, a lot idea. of opportunity in what's going on in the economy right now. So, so give that a thought. All right, so uh, this next one, it kind of reminds me of the one that said, you know, I shouldn't, uh, why, why would I waste money on rent when I can have worse? Because you know it's not it's not permanent. It's not there. This next one is one I think we hear. This might be the one we hear the most. I don't know. I, you know what I'm always curious is because this is what we do for a living. I wonder if more people, if we are more sensitive to this because we hear people tell us this all the time, or if the person man on the street, if you ask them, is this something you hear? But here here it is. Term insurance is just throwing your money away. Because if I buy a 20 year term life insurance policy and I die on 20 years in one day, it was worth nothing. I just wasted all that money that, that I paid that for 20 is what, years. What the situation this is put for us is usually an insurance agent has pitched one of our older clients on why you know term insurance is just a bad deal. It's because that insurance just is gone, going away after you've paid all those premium payments for all those years. And at the end, what do you have to show for right. it? Well, it's kind of the same thing is your car insurance. I mean, you actually hope you have nothing to show for it because that means you didn't have a claim. And with the life insurance, it's even more valuable because that means you didn't die. <laughs> but here's the thing that I think is important to understand. I, I kind of want to walk you through what, why, what's the better way to think about insurance. In life insurance specifically, if done properly for the majority of people, now look, there's specialized situations. Let me put that caveat out there. But for the majority of people, it is a risk that should go away over time. Okay, so it's a temporary problem. Maybe because, think about this, your kids, you want to make sure they go to college or have money saved for them and, and providing income while they're children and becoming adults. But hopefully in the next 20 years, like I have one that's a sophomore, right? if my 20 year term comes out and she's still in the house, something has gone horribly wrong because she will be graduating sure. and out. The, also, the income that I'm worried about my wife. I'm trying to build financial independence. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, if you die prematurely, there's a chance that you're going to die before you have truly built up that nest egg. Sure. So you need life insurance to bridge that shortfall. Mm -hmm. But 20 years in the future, if I keep diligently saving like I'm doing, that dollar, you know, that army of dollar bills, there should be no need to replace my income anymore because I'll have a big enough pot that I can self-insure. That's right. So since the need is going to go away, it's a temporary need, exactly what you said, it's okay if the policy goes away after that 20-year period. So I'm going I'm to rephrase what I just heard you say. If you have a temporary problem, it's okay to implement a temporary solution. That's exactly right. It's now, okay that it goes away. You just want to hear me say, Bo, you were right. Oh, man. Doesn't that sound good, guys? That's look, what the, he look, the whole hear. gallery is smiling. They love hearing let it. Me give you, let me give you one other thing. This is the dollars and cents of it. I pulled this up from NerdWild. had a, a blog post on the difference between whole life and term insurance, just to put an exclamation point yep. on this. Um, let's do males first. These are both 40-year-olds looking at $1 million of coverage, 20-year term. Perfect. The men... About six hundred bucks for term insurance. So cheap. It's really cheap. So you get a million dollars for six hundred dollars a year. That's the protection you get. Whole life, thirteen thousand nine hundred and two dollars. Woo! That's like a. I mean, it's a mortgage. <laughs> but I mean, realistic. That's big. It's does that have an engine on it? That's what I want to know. When you're paying that much, does that come with an engine on it? Because when I hear thirteen thousand nine hundred two, I'm like, 
That's a car. You bought a used car. The second female, term life insurance, $509. Okay. For a million dollars of coverage. Whole life, 11787 So I couldn't help myself because I'm like the investments, the nerdy numbers guy, right? I said, okay, if somebody could actually do the thing that we always hear people talk about, buy term, invest the difference, buy term, invest the difference. If you did that for the man, the difference in $13,900 and $600, if you invested that difference alone for 20 years, and I said 8% for a 40-year-old, I just picked the number out of the hat. That would leave you at the end of the term with six hundred and nine thousand dollars for a man. Just investing the difference. So you had insurance for twenty years. At the end of twenty years, yeah, the insurance went away, but you got six hundred thousand. Not not a bad gig. For the female, you do the same thing. The difference in eleven thousand eight hundred and five hundred dollars. You invest that for twenty years. You're left with five hundred and sixteen thousand. So yeah, insurance went away, but you still have half a million dollars if you're disciplined enough to be able to invest the difference. I think it makes tons of sense. I, I noticed in the notes, Bo, because we, we've used everything in this illustration has been 20-year term. And 20-year yep. term is super popular, sure. but that's not for everybody yep. because you might be catching it being a little late in the game. Um, so base your term based upon how old the kids are. Mm-hmm. Think about when you think you're going to get them out of the house. When is your date of financial independence? Yep. Because that's, that's, that's what the other risk that you're really trying to cover for. And then as you put, think about term staggering because maybe your debt is going to be paid off 10 years in the future, so you don't need to protect that anymore. Maybe your financial independence date falls off here, or maybe your college debt's even before that. Yep. You could stagger these, so maybe you do a 10-year term, a 15-year term, and a 20-year term. You're just at a price and look at it. Yep. Nothing wrong with that with saving a few extra bucks. Love it. So let's move on to this next one. I hear this one. This one, you practically, I could pull this out of our comments section. The stock market is no better than gambling. There are so many people in the comments section that are telling us, who would invest right now? This stock market is so oh, overpriced. So frothy. It's just going to get crushed. I mean, I hear that stock market is no better than gambling. That's what people, people say yeah. this stuff all the time. Yeah. Let me give you some perspective. The S&P 500 has gone up 74% of the years since 1926. So if you're talking about on a year-by-year basis from 1926 all the way through last year. 2018. 74% of those years, three out of four, the market's positive, greater than zero, positive rate of was return. Was the market up or was it down for the year? 74% of the time, it's up. I, what, are the, what are the Vegas That doesn't odds? sound like gambling. What are the Vegas odds? I, I don't Man, know. I want on that table. <laughs> Put me on the table that's paying, that I win, that me, the player, wins 74%. 74%. I've been on a lot of games that feel like the casinos at that 74%, <laughs> but never ever do you see the player get a 74% probability that they're going to come out on the winning side of it. Yep. Far from gambling. So listen, I got some stats for you. You know I love to give you guys stats so you can seem smart at the cocktail parties or just around your relatives. 92 years, the S&P 500 has positive calendar years total, 70, sorry, 74% of the time, and 26% of the time it's negative. Sure. Okay. If you want to know what the average positive years were, it was 21%. Average calendar year. Over the positive so if you looked at just on average the positive years, it's around a twenty-one percent return. Holy cow! Well, but you got to moderate that okay. because the negative years average fourteen percent. Okay, so sometimes- so a lot of you guys are probably doing this is not good math. You're saying twenty-one minus fourteen, that's seven. You can't do that because remember it's up seventy-four <laughs> percent of the time. That's why it is such a positive thing. And that's why it's closer to 10% historically. It's because it's up much more than it's down. But I still thought it was kind of interesting that those years that it's positive, 21% is the average. Years that it's negative, 14% loss is the average. So if I should not think about investing as gambling, what's a better way to think about it? How should I approach the thought of looking at investing? Well, I think that, I mean, you're going to be looking at your age, your goals, your risk profile. You're going to be building a portfolio that matches all those things I just mentioned, and it's a deliberate plan. As soon as it becomes a deliberate plan, you have now transitioned yourself from the speculative side of investing, which is AKA gambling, to now you've created a plan that's going to actually help you reach your financial goals. So rather than, you know, or gambling, where you're just kind of throwing it out there and crossing your fingers and wishing and hoping, you, when you're an investor, can put a plan in place that that not certainly, but almost certainly leads to success over a long enough time period. And, and here's the thing, because once again, I hate to keep picking on you guys, but I want you to keep making comments, is that all of you guys are talking about how negative things are right now. Mm-hmm. 
Go out there. I mean, it's not just me. It's not just Warren Buffett. I mean, think about just what's going on with your cell phone, what's going on in the medical field, what's going on in globalization. I mean, guys, there's a lot of cool things to get excited about. If you just turn off the news media and actually paid attention to what's going on in the world, there's a lot of reasons to be pretty excited because innovation and technology is just walking and marching forward. I mean, things are advancing a lot faster than they ever have. And I think there's going to be opportunities for you to profit off that as well as make your life just a little bit better. All right, Brian. So uh, I hear all that. Stock market investing. You're going to be the troll now. Here comes the troll. Troll Bo is coming on the scene. Stock market investing makes me nervous. I, I, I want to do something a little safer. Yeah. I, I, want to get, I want a sure thing. You want a sure thing? No. What you want, because I know where you're going. When the sky's falling, there is one investment that always comes on the horizon. Been around since ancient times. I mean, if I had times. one, I probably could have gone to a dumpster about six years ago and found one of these. It's one of those signs I could have spun around. You know, it says, we buy gold. <laughs> do you see the you know, sign did, did you see? That's what Look those guys this, used no, to do. They you're nailing spin it. them around I love, and no, that's catch perfect. it. It's, we buy gold. I mean, it was, you know, there's those big signs. And that's what the sky's falling. There's all kind of people that come out and go, go buy gold. Yep. Gold. Gold will keep you safe. And we've done shows on it. Yep. If you want to know, see, we took it down, I think. In 20, was it 2011 that we did that our first YouTube video on yeah, why yeah, you yeah, should yeah. not That's buy right. on gold versus... We call it Fool's Gold. Yeah, so, I mean... We, more, we, we took that video out. It was, <laughs> it, it was not up to more production to... <laughs> quality standards. <laughs> so, let's go. You know, I've already thrown him one, you know, attaboy. So, let's, let's look at what Warren Buffett's thoughts on gold are. I'm just going to read these quotes because they're that powerful. This came from his 2019 letter to shareholder, it, shareholders. It was... Those who regularly preach doom because of government budget deficits, and he even throws himself under the bus. He says, as I regularly did, regularly did myself for many years, might note that our country's national debt has increased roughly 400-fold during the last of my 77-year periods. That's 40,000%. Suppose you had foreseen this increase and panicked at the prospect of runaway deficits and a worthless currency. How often do we hear comments about fiat currency? Yeah. To, quote, protect yourself, you might have eschewed stocks and opted instead to buy three and a quarter ounces of gold with your $114.75. So instead of investing that $114.75, we're going to go buy gold with it. So he continues. He says, and quote, and what would that supposed protection have delivered? You would now have an asset worth about $4,200. Well, that doesn't sound bad. Yeah, 114 up to $4,200. But listen to this. Bad. This is an exclamation point. Less than 1% of what would have been realized from a simple, unmanaged investment in America business. Psst, he's talking about the S&P 500. The magical metal was no match for the American metal. You see God, what he did there? He's such a word. Brilliant. So think about this. Let's look at the data because here's the actual details he gave later in the piece. In 1942 is when he started investing okay. in stocks. If you invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 in 1942, at the end of 2018, it would have been worth $51 million. That's, that's million. Almost, that's almost unfathomable. To that's think a lot about. of money. If you had invested $10,000 in gold in 1942... That have only been worth four hundred thousand dollars. So okay, so four hundred thousand is a lot of money, and that's pretty good. It ain't fifty-one million. So we did our own research. Let me—I got one more Buffett quote, and then I want to show a slide that we did. Another Buffett quote about gold. In other words, for every dollar you could have made in American business, you'd have less than a penny of gain by buying into a store of value which people tell you to run to every time you get scared by the headlines. I like that. There's one more it. exclamation yep. point on don't let these guys fear you out of losing all the money you could make. Yep. So here's another thing. We did our own research piece on it. We did a brief history of what has happened to gold and compared it to S&P 500. In 1928, if you wanted to buy an ounce of gold, it was $20.66. Okay. You follow me? Yep, I'm with you. So we're going to put that as a line in the sand. We're going to buy into the S&P 500. You know, okay. at the time, it was not 500, but the S&P index. Sure. 1928, we're going to buy $20.66. So we get an apples to apples comparison. Yep. 
into 2018. By the way, into 2018, market lost close to 20% or did lose you 20% did temporarily. Quarter, right. So I'm not even cherry picking because we could choose right now close to June 30th of 2019. And this number would be even significantly better because we've had a great recovery in the yep. first half of 2019. But I, I went conservative and said, let's do this right. So at the end of 2018, an ounce of gold was worth $1,428. Again, doesn't sound bad. 20 bucks turns into 1400 bucks. Not and, and you can see right there in the middle, that gold turned, earned you 4.72% on average on per average. year. Okay. If you If you calculated the this out. The geometric return, yep. Geom I like that. You sound fancier than average. <laughs> geometric return. So we'll go with that. If you look into, just to compare it, in, in 20, into 2018, the S&P 500 now would be worth that $20 investment, 96000 almost $97,000, or a return, rate of return right under 9.5%. So over a 90-year time period, I mean, if we're just thinking about this, 90 years, you have one investment that over that 90-year time period turned from $20 into 1400 or you had another opportunity that was $20 to almost $100,000. Yeah, big difference. It's not it's hard to day. see which one looks a little bit, a little bit better. And I'll, and I'll go ahead and tell you the same thing I did in 2011, if you're so worried about the world economy and the American economy that you think you need gold because you're going to be biting off a tip of it to trade for food, because that's what, how are you, you go, you go break a coin in half and hand somebody a portion. You probably need bullets before you need gold. Fact. I mean, because that, if we get to the point that you're having to break coins in half to get a, a you know, a few bushels of something, you're in a bad place. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Here's the last one I want to close it out with. This one is near and dear to my heart because I come from a public accounting I was, I background. Think we love, I think we left this one last for you, I think. Yeah, you, want, you wanted to give a nod to my CPA-ness. There we go. Is that a word, CPA-ness? Ness? I can't even say it. C cpa ness <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> here's the last one. It's deductible. Oh, and maybe my I'm the only one that hears this because I have, everybody's always trying to tell me, isn't that deductible? Isn't that deductible? Oh, I'm going to do this because I'm going to get some tax write-offs. Well, so I'm going to get some tax write-offs Let's write -offs just go through a few of these. Rental property. Everybody's Ooh. always telling me, rental property is awesome because even, you know you know what? You get to deduct those losses. You're, you, this investment is so good, you're going to be losing money. You get to deduct it off your taxes. Love you it. just take all that money you're saving on your taxes. What they don't tell you, as soon as your income makes between $100,000 to $150,000, all those losses that you're so excited about because you get to deduct them. That's how much we hate paying taxes, by the way, is that we celebrate deducting those <laughs> losses. Is that, that you phase out of those. You have to start carrying them forward for the future. That's not a great thing. I'm yep. not picking, that's not a pick on completely of rental property. It's just don't do something because you're so excited about the tax deduction. Yep. That's not, try to make money on all of your transactions. Right. You don't want to deduct the losses only. I've had people come up to me. I had a guy who was in the production side and broadcasting. He told me that his, you know, um, his cable TV was completely deductible. Oh. Because he had to stay up on current events. Okay, that makes sense. That's right. rational. That sounds okay. reasonable. I had another person tell me that, that their job required them to look good at work, so their haircut as well as their suit. It was not you. I would, even though you do think it is your job to look good, you were not the person that came to me and said your suits or your, your outfits as well as your haircut were deductible. Um, all the, these are things I've legitimately I heard, and I, it made me every time I have somebody come to me with these cockamamie scheme of I always think this famous saying that it's not famous because it was my boss that said it to me. I'll make it famous. <laughs> I had a boss, my first boss out of college at the accounting firm I worked at. He said, Brian, it's all deductible until you get caught. That's it. And man. think about it, when you file a tax return, they'll send you a refund. Yep. It, it, you, you, just because they hit that, put that money in your bank account does not mean they agreed with your return because nope. they can come back a few years later. But everything is deductible until you get caught. So let me explain what I mean by that. Do not first, like the rental property and other examples, mm -hmm. don't let the tax tell wag the entire financial dog. Yep. Because they, like I said, there are so many people that hate paying taxes that they will step into schemes just so they don't have to pay their favorite uncle taxes. Have you yeah. not seen those things? I'm, oh, not, I'm yeah, not even absolutely. calling in. We've seen some of those oil and gas partnerships that we had some decades ago. Unique there's land a, deals. There's, there's some land deals right now where people are taking huge charitable deductions on that the IRS has come out and said, Woo, be careful, guys, because yeah. we're, we're going to pick up our big stick and hit you with them eventually. So, I, And this is the other thing I think about. Maybe it's because I've actually sat across from the IRS at actual IRS yeah. tax audits. Always visualize yourself anytime you are taking a deduction that's in the gray area. I want you to picture yourself sitting across from the IRS agent 
and visualize describing why this is why, deductible. Why your haircut is deductible. Why it's necessary I think for you it to do will, your job. I think it will help you stay on good ground because remember, I want you to maximize your deductions, your legal deductions. We love you minimizing your taxes legally. That's the thing is it's got to be legally. We say it all the time, Brian. Uh, ta tax evasion is illegal. Ask Al Capone, right? Yeah. That's what got him. Tax avoidance, highly encouraged. And we're here to help you guys figure out how to do so that. So just make sure you're on stable ground because um, I've, I've had grown men call me crying sitting across from the IRS. Yep. So don't, don't get yourself in that pickle of a situation. You've heard me say it. I'll say it again because it's been you know probably a few months, a few years since I've done a show on it. If you ever get a full audit, meaning that they ask for an in-person meeting, you do not represent yourself. You hire an accountant or an attorney to represent you. Do not show up um, for yourself. It would just not be a good idea. This is, this is what I, I love so much about this show, Brian. It seems like we are inundated with information. I mean, we are constantly between our watches and our cell phones and the TV and the media, we are always bombarded with people trying to tell us how to make decisions that are in our best interest, giving us advice, whether we're seeking it out or not, it just seems to flood over us. That's true. And it becomes really, really difficult to sift through what's good, sound, solid advice and some of those things that you should ignore. And so today we just wanna take nine that we hear often. We actually had like four or five more. We that, did. They yep. hit the cutting room floor. Guys, if it sounds too good to be true, there's a lot that it probably is. I mean, that's just the thing. So use some common sense. And it's like you said, but a lot of this stuff had tidbits of good advice. And some of it is actually okay advice. It's just, but there's unintended consequences right. that you're just not thinking about that could actually derail. It's just like buying real estate is not a bad thing. And even buying a house in a neighborhood. But if you are the poorest person in that neighborhood it's just going to have long-term effects. Right. So think about that. So even things that seem like on first glance that they're good for you financially, just give it time to think about them and process and then always begin with the end in mind and just always think, is this going to help me get to where I want to be from a financial independence standpoint, from a just fulfillment and a happiness standpoint, all this stuff works together. Guys, we love hearing from you. If you have some ideas of pieces of financial advice that you've heard or bad stuff you've been given, let us know about it. You've heard, we check our emails, go out to the website, go to moneyguide.com. You can go to contact us. You can ask us a question or share us a story. You can leave a comment below in the comments. We actually look at it and read that. We have the whole team. We talk about it. A lot of the content that we comes up come up with is actually generated by you guys. So if you have ideas for us, thoughts for us, be sure to reach out. We're here to be a resource for you guys. We want to engage in that way. Well, guys, I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. Go check out moneyguy.com. Give us your email address. Also subscribe, whether, you know, if you're a podcast person, also subscribe to that so you're getting this stuff automatically. Sonny just asked a great, he asked a great oh, question. Go ahead. Let's he do said, it. hey, can, can you put the nine things in an email to the subscribers? One thing that we do that you may not know about is if you go out to moneyguy.com, give us your email address, sign up on the website. When we have shows like this that have some really good pieces of information, maybe it's the charts that you just saw, maybe it's a list of the nine uh, financial things to avoid, we'll actually send something out to you. It might be a list, it might be a spreadsheet, it might be a document that you can actually take and use. We don't put it on the website, we don't make it available anywhere else except to our email subscribers. So if that's something you're interested in, go to the website, sign up, and that will be in your inbox in the next week or two. All right, guys, I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. We'll be back soon. Thank you for tuning in.